Minnesota Sports Leader. Leader Fan, Fan Radio Network, and KFAN.com. 35 seconds past the hour, 3 o'clock, Central Daylight, no, Standard Time. Bumper to Bumper Show is back. It's live. It's on the air for this midweek edition on a a beautiful Wednesday afternoon here in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. We want the instrumental version, actually the alternative vocal version that we can get in uh, on and out quickly. Because we got Mike Conley, uh, Timberwolves point guard, right off the top via the Connecticut Water Systems hotline. And I think before we uh, get to any other matters, we have to congratulate you for apparently um, what well, kind of making history last night. I assume you're aware of this. I, I got this stat via John Krasinski, who I'm sure you know well, covers the Wolves for the Athletic. And he sent this out at 12.59 a.m. 36-year-old Mike Conley had three blocks tonight, second oldest Timberwolf to do that. KG did it when he was 39. He is the first NBA player, 6-1 or shorter, to have three-plus blocks in a game at 36 years or older since 40-year-old John John Stockton. I assume this is the most important stat of all to you. It's the only one I care about, obviously. <laughs> uh, I was made aware of it this, uh, at the end of the game, I thought it was hilarious but you know now it's also cool at the same time so i'm i'm not too mad no so um is uh, look i mean you've got the lineage obviously your dad we talked about that um, many many months ago uh gold medal winner uh, track and field star i think he won the gold in the triple jump in the olympics if i'm not mistaken mm-hmm. you would i'm sure know yeah. but he was also a long jump guy as well so is it possible mike conley jr picked the wrong career could you be could you have been an Olympic level track and field great in the uh, in some of the you know the the jumping ca- classifications? Yeah, uh, my dad thinks so for sure. That's, <laughs> that's something that um, he claims to this day. He, he he uses that as an example of why I'm still playing today uh, in basketball because <laughs> I I should have been a world class you know uh, track athlete. So um, it's, it runs in the genes, and I'm. Uh, you know, thankful for, but I think I picked the right sport for me. So did you, at any of the three now, refresh my memory, because I was in and out of watching the game. Did you do, did, do you ever do the finger wag? Because I would think at 36, you should be allowed uh, to do the finger wag if you like. Now, that's generally not your style. You're not a taunter. You're not a guy known for any of that stuff. But was there ever, was there, an, was that the, you know, the occasion where you said, maybe I should finger wag on this occasion? It depends on the block, you know, because they, they classify blocks differently nowadays. Sometimes it, it could be like, you know, you guy going up and I strip them as they go up. But if I catch somebody like going in for a, a layup and I smack it off the glass or yes. something, then you're going to catch a finger wag or like some kind of evil stare at the bench or something, you know, <laughs> do something crazy. So who was the tallest guy you whose shot you blocked uh, on this occasion? Uh, I think it was... Probably Jeremy Grant. Okay, I, think I got he caught him in uh, transition. He was trying to get a layup, but other than that, uh, I think the other ones were uh, the point guards. So okay. it was more of my height. Yeah, and so a lot of it. Well, you know, we've talked about this before too. You, you, you've always been classified as an accomplished defender. In fact, I think you had some early, uh, earlier in your career, some all defensive team awards to your name. Uh-huh. Everybody gets older. You have as well, and the assumption is that as you get older. What you lose in terms of maybe the physical ability you make up for in terms of moxie or understanding angles better or playing, I guess, good team defense. How do you view how you try to stay relevant defensively? Yeah, um, that's the thing is, is you know, you, you definitely, the lateral quickness and the things you were able to get in and out of cuts when you were younger, you just can't do. It's like your, your knees will explode, basically. So it's like, Nowadays, you have to um, be more conscious of where you are in relation to the ball handler and, and, and where your team is um, set up defensively. And having those recognitions allows you to to be in the right spots and guess right. You know, be in the right position for when a guy does drive 
you know, you don't have to work as hard as you maybe had to when you were younger um, because you're just trying to take the the two step angle instead of you know trying to do four or five steps to cut a guy off and um, and and I've always been a smart defender before anything so that, I think that's always you know been good for me to be able to to be on a team that has so many you know guys that can defend and and for me to be the guy that's the fourth or fifth guy out there that that you know as far as defenders are because of how good we are I, I love that you know being able to, to, you know, I'm still a really good defender, but not be seen as like one of the top defenders on the team is a pretty cool um, spot for me because I know I can still hold my own and, and, and affect the game in the way I do. Wolves point guard Mike Conley joining us at the top of the program. Wolves knocking off Portland last night, 121 uh, to 109. So do we, you know, um, you never know how accurate stories are. You're getting at least in print and online, a lot of credit for, uh, even though you didn't score any of Anthony Edwards' 41 points, you're getting credit for um, many of them because of the belief that he was kind of on the fence about whether he was going to play, a little bit sore, and that you as the veteran leader you are kind of cajoled him a little bit and said, come on, man, you're you're not that hurt, you're fine, you're going to be okay. So is this story accurate or has it been has it been embellished a bit? No, that's a hundred percent, hundred percent. He'll tell you. He he loves to tell stories, but <laughs> he. I saw him the night before. Um, we were getting back from coming in from L.A. We walked, his room was close to mine, and I, we'll kind of walked by him, and he was like, "Man, you know, kind of like moving slow." And like, "Man, my knee, you know, is kind of <laughs> sore. I don't know." I'm like, "Man, stop. You'll feel better in the morning, man. You know, I don't want to hear that. Like, because he don't want to know what I'm feeling. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause I'm." I'm sore. Yeah. I got every every part of my body is, is 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 hurting and sore. So I'm like, man, come on, you know, we gonna be good. And next day, you know, <laughs> before the game, he's still like, man, you know, I you know, I don't know, man. Well, I'm tired. Uh, I'm like, man, you gonna you gonna be fine, man. Just make a couple buckets early. Your energy will pick up. You'll be good. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, he he had the night he had. And I think he realized, you know, this mind over matter at that point. It's an interesting uh, question because. You know, you've been around a long time. Um, there are players who are hurt and shouldn't play, you know, when they are hurt or there's a chance they're going to aggravate an injury. And I remember, I don't remember who I was talking to about this. It may have been the, the late great Flip Saunders a long time ago that, that he thought one of the challenges for lots of players when they come into the league is that they have to understand they will never be 100% again. And that doesn't mean that they shouldn't play, but that you do have to learn to try to fight through some stuff. So as a veteran, you know, how do you measure, how do you weigh that when, when you know, there's times where a player might actually be hurt, you back off? How do you judge exactly when you think it's your role to, you know, maybe maybe needle just a little bit and when to back off? Yeah, um, you know, I think it, it pertains to the time of the year a lot, a lot of the time, because um, at this point in the season, um, I don't think there's a player that doesn't have an injury, you know, that's not playing through something. Um, for as many games as we've played and miles we've had so far. Um, so, you know, and there's points of the season where you're, you know, you're looking at the schedule and you're like, man, we need to win these next four games or we need to uh, come out of this road trip, you know, positive, whatever, wherever that may be. And, and you're looking across the room, you're like, you know, everybody's sore, everybody's hurting. How bad is your injury? Mm-hmm. You know, how bad is, you know, are you on you know, in a boot or crutches or is it, you know, swelling, soreness, like chronic issue, like, you got to kind of know the person, but at the same time, if, like it, if it's stuff that, you know, I know that everybody's dealing with and, and some that you, you at night to night basis that it's possible to push through, man, like you go out there and push through and it's one of those guys who he, he won't miss the game unless he's hurt, you know, like he's got to really be hurt. And a lot of our guys are like that and I'm the same way. And, um, and you know, the soft tissue stuff is what yeah. kind of is the, the scarier stuff, you know, the, the hammies, the yeah. calves, the pulled muscles, stuff like that, where, um, you know, those can be a little bit tricky. So those are the ones you really got to pay attention to. But the bruises, the bumps, the swelling, stuff like that, I think guys are, are pretty, you know, accustomed to trying to deal with that. Well, you know, um, we've talked a couple times over the years. Um, in fact, this summer, uh, uh, your head coach, Chris Finch, was in studio here about his own philosophy regarding load management. And he's, uh, adam- I don't have to tell you, I'm sure you know, adamantly opposed to the concept. He doesn't like the direction the league has taken. In that regard, he likes, you know, the new rules, at least attempting to discourage it. I don't know how effective it has been. 
But this team, uh, Mike, seems to have sort of staked a claim different than a lot of teams in that regard. And I don't know if it's about relative youth or it's just a philosophy. What's your view on that whole issue? Yeah, um, you know, I think our team as a whole has, has a has a collective mindset, starting from coach to the players. You got the right players involved who who don't want to miss a game. Like they, like like we talked about earlier, those those injuries that everybody's dealing with, a lot of guys sit out for. You know, a lot of guys will take, you know, an extra day or two. Like, you know what, I mean? let me just take the night off because, you know, we should win this game. You know, let me take the night off because we – but we, we got a team that's, you know, makeup where it's like, you know, you don't want to be that guy missing the game. You know, you don't want to be that guy that everybody else is, is fighting, everybody else is pushing, everybody else is um, building up that, you know, rapport on the court as, as, as being Iron Man kind of kind of mentality. Um, so it's like a culture. And uh, and for us, it's, it's uh, you know, it's been good. And I think we've actually been one of the, the healthier yeah. teams out there, be, ironically enough, you know, this – but I think guys are, are willing to fight and play through and realize that you know, you're going to be fine uh, in the long run. Regular season, as you well know, is a grind, and, and part of the challenge is to not overreact, good or bad, to any single game. But I'm wondering if a game like the one against the Clippers, even as a veteran player, you looked at as, okay, this is kind of a cool litmus test game for us, where we are uh, we know where we are in the standings, but we know what people think of the Clippers. We know about the veteran uh, winning players they have in their team. They were, I think they'd won 27 of their last 33. You're playing them there. And you take it to them. You end up dominating that game, especially in the second half. Uh, do you view it that way? Is it one of those games to say, yeah, this is a nice confidence booster, even if we have a lot of confidence in ourselves, to see how we held up against a team You know, a lot of people are talking about as being a threat. I'm sure they still are. How did you view uh, the way that your your club came out of that game? Yeah, um, you know, going into that game, it was it was it was going to have to be a statement game for us. If we win this game, you know, I think it allows us to um, feel good, real good about where we're at. And uh, you know, the Clippers are a team that we should we, they're going to be contending for a championship, and we want to be you know in that same kind of conversation. If if we want to continue to stay in that conversation, we have to. To have have nights like we did in LA, where we came in and, and, and won uh, on the road, and, um, and especially when they're playing, I think some of the better basketball in the league, uh, especially over the last few months. Um, so for us, you know, to go in there and, and snatch that win was was huge. I think it's it's great for our confidence. It's great for um, our guys to see, you know, who we can be and what level we can play at. Uh, and not only that, it's just how hard you have to play to, to do that, how, you know, the, the things you have to, to put in to, to win games like that. So, you know, it's, it's good lessons learned for us, and hopefully um, it's going to bode well for us going forward. And it's so ironic because, of course, not that long ago, um, a lot of us, and you including, included, were lamenting the fourth quarter collapse against the Bulls. In fact, I think that was the game where afterwards uh, one or two of the reporters asked you, and you, I think, said something, in fact, I don't even know. Sometimes I don't even know. <laughs> What to do or what yeah. we need to do? Um, what what did you learn through that? And and what do you guys? What do you think it is that you guys? How you try to process that? Get to the bottom of it. Is it open conversation? Is it just playing different, better, whatever? Because it's quite a contrast. You know the Bulls game, obviously, um, yeah. and and the Clippers game. Even though we know there's going to be ups and downs during any season. Yeah, I think the Bulls game um, just kind of it all came to a head at that point, but it. We had been struggling, you know, in that in, in those parts of the game for you know the latter part of a month, um, and so it had been building. And I think up until that point, uh, we had had conversations as a group, as a team, uh, long film sessions. And I think what came out of our the one that was most recent was that we just weren't putting the the work in offensively. Like we put so much effort defensively. On the, you know on the table we're we're scrambling we're running we're closing out we're giving everything we got and then offensively you know we're we're hard pressed to cut for each other you know we won't cut we won't get to the corner we won't space um, and we'll do it in the first two quarters when everybody's fresh you know third third quarter fourth quarter when things start to get slower we tend to get slow you know our team slows down and we you know have to rely on ISO and whether we make or miss shots and or not turn the ball over and I think. Um, you know, we weren't getting a lot of shots up because we were turning the ball over due to bad spacing, due to guys not, you know, working to get open, due, due to guys not, you know, setting 
harder screens and just we weren't sacrificing enough on that in the floor. And I think what we're seeing lately in the last you know week or so, two weeks, and um, these last few games is just guys are willing to, to sacrifice their body a little bit more on that end, and and it's, it's opening up the floor for guys to make easier decisions and not have to you know be a, be a hero all the time. Mike, you played a long time, and you've played on some pretty damn good teams, including teams that had some pretty significant playoff upsets. I think you were an eight and beat the second, you were this part of the second team to ever win over a one. So I'm curious. I mean, is this? Do you believe this is the best team you've ever played on? Uh, I honestly, you know, I, I I try to shy away from saying because I know I've been on some good ones, but I, every time I look up and down the roster, I honestly think this might be. Um, one of the deepest teams I've been on and uh, one of the best, um, I think, roster constructed teams, just like the size that we have, the defensive prowess that we have, the amount of defensive players that we have, two way guys, uh, and a young, you know, young couple, you know, studs on our team, you know, and Jaden, Cat, like that makeup um, is like. For me, a point guard's dream, man. I, this is a role I've I've wanted to have since I was a rookie. I don't, yeah, I love being on, on teams that have such great talent and, uh, and and you know want to be great. So this is going to be you know a fun ride for me. I'm excited for where we go, um, you know, this season. Um, you added, of course, a backup point guard before the uh, the trade deadline. Monte Morris. He's played a little bit now. Um, w- give me your impressions of him and and where you think he can help you guys. Uh, man, Monty's going to be great for us, man. He's, um, uh, I, I call him, he's like, he plays a lot like I do, honestly. And I thought that since he's came into the league, uh, very control, very under control, makes great decisions, can score at all levels and, um, makes timely, timely buckets and winning plays. And, um, and he's, you know, he's a vet. He's a guy that's been on some great teams, been on, been in Denver. He's been a part of those playoff series, played against him a lot there and, um, so he knows his way around the court, and uh, just having another uh, a mind out there like his is going to do wonders for our team. Just you know, cutting down on turnovers, just being solid, and um, and I know that he you know came off an injury earlier this year, so he's probably still just getting back into um, basketball shape because he hadn't you know played as much um, in Detroit. So I know he's going to just continually get better and better, and I'm excited to see him uh, just integrate with the team. The, um, the, the that was obviously the at this at least to this point the only move that you guys made. Other teams, of course, were very ambitious. I feel like part of that ambition is a view that perhaps a lot of franchises have that they, that this feels a little open this year. Now it might in the end not be. Who knows? I mean, Boston looks awfully good again. Denver's still Denver, but do you get that feeling that you know that as we've said before? Teams generally don't come out of nowhere to get to the finals. That's usually a process of you got to go through some you know ups and downs, and maybe you get to the second round and so forth. But I I sense that people feel like this might be a year where, like a team in your position, without really any playoff winning equity, feels like yeah, why not us? Why not now? Is that the view within the team? Do you think? I think so. I think it's something that we we recognize. You know, in training camp, you know, coming in, we said, hey, this is, it could be wide open. You know, this is a season that if we handle business like we, like we can, we can be one of those teams that, that, uh, surprise people at the end of the day and, and have a chance at running, running out, you know, after a championship. And, um, and the league has never, I think it's never been more kind of spread out with talent. Yeah. I think a lot of teams, a lot of teams have, I mean, especially you look at the West, man, it, I, yeah, I don't even know if you want to be the one or two seed. The teams you have to play at the yeah. seventh and eighth seed are just as you know That's just tricky. As good and capable. Like it's like uh, unreal how deep uh, these teams are. So uh, I think everybody around the league truthfully believes um, that they have a shot, and we definitely do. I think you know Tim Connolly has built the team to to win and win now, and um, I think that uh, you know Finchie and the rest of us have have lived by that, and hopefully you know we get that opportunity. Two last things for Mike Conley, the uh, Timberwolves point guard, kind enough to join us off the top of the show. They're in between games uh, against the Portland Trailblazers, having won last night, 121-109. mentioned Edwards uh, with 41 and um, uh, the role you might have played to make sure that he that he had gave it a shot. And obviously he was more than uh, capable of, of surviving whatever that knee issue is he's dealing with. Um, an interesting comment from Finchie after the game. We're not going to play it now because it's a little lengthy. We may play it later in the show. 
But if I boil it down, it, it was simply that he believes Anthony is at his best, and this is what he's still trying to figure out, and he's young. He's at his best when he makes quick decisions, not kind of holding on to the ball, surveying. And again, I know when he's on a heater at times like he was last night, you let him do whatever he kind of wants to do, right? You have to almost to play that out. But that struck me as an interesting observation that I think all the great scorers at some point need to figure out, right? That the quicker you go, part of what Finchie's point is, the quicker you go, there's also a better chance there's going to be openings elsewhere that other people are going to be available to him if he has to give up the ball. Yeah, no, Finchie, Finchie's right. I think it's it's more about his his quick decisions. Like, it's got to be, you know, I tell him all the time, like, man, you don't have to make everything tough. Like, it, like if you get an open shot, take an open shot. How many open shots are you going to get in a game? You're our best player. You're a guy that's going to get double teamed. Like, take the three when it's open or take the, the one dribble pull up when it's open. Don't try to, you know, create something that's not there. Um, but also use the, adva- use the advantages that you get. Like, you come off the pin down and they – they trail you, keep going, like drive it and, and take the advantage that you have and then make a play from it as opposed to like pulling the ball back out and starting to get into an ISO and, you know, making it, having to make a tough shot. So I think Finchie's correct in the sense that like, hey, you know, when you catch the ball, shoot, pass, drive, like right away, go go right to what you're doing um, because they cannot stay in front of you. They, they're too strong, you're too fast, too athletic, and, and you have so much to your game that, you know, when you start playing in that in that space of the, of the court it's it, it opens up a lot of things for him and like you said when he gets hot you can just you let him have those possessions where he can you know dribble dribble and, and make fadeaways and, and tough shots because he's, he's done his work uh you know throughout the game we started uh, kidding you about the fact that you had the three blocks last night and that uh you're only you're the first uh nba player six one or shorter to have three plus blocks in a game at 36 year old years old or older since john stockton did it at age 40 in 2003, can Mike Conley see himself still playing in the NBA at age 40? Oh, um, if I want to make it to 20 seasons, I'm definitely going to, I'm definitely seeing myself there. And I think, I think that's what I want to try to do. So I'm, a, I'm going to keep my body right. You know, yeah. if I feel anywhere close to I feel now, uh, I definitely I don't I don't see slowing down anytime soon. Why not, man? This is you, you, this team is the core is young enough and good enough where you you, you have to think there, we can make multiple take multiple shots at this thing, correct? Oh, for sure. And that's the exciting part, man. You know, just just looking at the roster and look where we're at. We we've got you know we've got we've got some years to make it work. Great to catch up. Thanks, Mike. We'll talk down the road. All right, thank you. Appreciate I appreciate it. you, Mike Conley, with excellent uh, stuff from him as he always gives us. Uh, somebody mentioned, uh, have you ever talked to Mike about his dad, Conley Sr.? We alluded to him during the interview. Uh, Jeff in Duluth writes, I remember watching him. He was a track star, world champion, gold medalist in the triple jump. Yeah, in fact, I think the first time we got acquainted with Conley, it might have even been during training camp. Media day, yep. Uh, media day. We spent a lot of time on, if I mentioned that I'm old enough to have covered his father uh, at, at a couple of different Olympics. And indeed, uh, Mike Conley Sr. was a great uh, triple jump. In fact, he was a gold medalist. He was a gold medalist, as Jeff and Duluth says, in the uh, a triple jump. He was also a long jump guy as uh, as well. A terrific career. And with, I think, a similar uh, personality or sensibility. You know, we, we've talked about the fact that he's got, that the only technical foul that technically was ever called on him got rescinded the next day. It was a bench situation. So, to this day, he remains without a single Technical foul. By the way, how many does Anthony Edwards have? Now, do we, are we going to have to worry about him missing a game? Because I don't remember what the threshold is on... I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's like 16, isn't it? Oh, it's, is it that many? I think it's a pretty high number. Oh! Which doesn't oh. mean he can't get there. No, but he's not close to that, I don't think. I want to say for the season... I don't think he's above 6 or 7 or 8 for the season. Do you? I don't think he's in double digits. It is sixteen. So sixteen. That's more than suspended. I realized. Okay, yeah. I don't so think that's he's, how many texts. I don't think he's close to that. By the way, somebody else mentioned. I heard um, Wolves are getting a lot of love nationally, as as you might expect. Again, after the the Clippers victory and just their general disposition and position, um, I heard Frank Isola say we only that the Wolves only have eleven road games left this season. That Minnesota. Yeah. Why not us? And why not now? Ant has nine. Oh, nine. Okay, I thought he. So that's a little more than I thought. Now look at this company, though. 
I mean, because okay. we always rip yeah, our guys. Right. Like Trey Young has 12. Luca has 11, not nearly enough. So does Trey have the most? No, Dylan Brooks has the most, 13. <laughs> There's a shocker. Bobby Portis has 12. Really? So he and Trey Young are tied. Where's Cat? I don't, Pretty far down the list? I don't think Cat's been teed up much this year. No, you're right, actually. He has not been. He's Rudy's got, a few. got Rudy's got four. Rudy's got more than Cat? I don't know. I haven't. I might have right. skipped past Cat. Right. D'Lo's got six. LeBron's D-Lo. got six. Okay. Joker's got six. Mm. Ant's got nine. One ahead of Jason Tatum and Porzingis. So he leads the team easily, I would say. So maybe we need to relax on you our guys. You think we got to back off on uh, being well, tough on our guys? Because getting teed yeah, up. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just the NBA. There's quite a few. Uh, Borton Volvo guest lineup. Let me give you the rest of it. Um, Kessler is scheduled in studio at 5.30 today. we got a snownami coming, apparently. Our first snownami of the year. And if it's anything more than two inches of snow, we're going to name it. Oh, really? Well, yeah, because we got to... When are we going to have another chance to? Our Snonami um, voice guy texted me this morning, Ryan Donaldson. Really? Is he, is, well, he said, is he needy and hungry and ready? He was, but in classic Donaldson fashion, because it is Wednesday of a work week, he's apparently going on vacation later tonight and won't be available to make a Snonami. <laughs> it's just you can't make Doesn't it up. Doesn't he go on like eight vacations yes. a year now? Yes. Well, can you, you're, you can't be mad at him. Or are you just jealous of him? I'm confused. It sounded like you're mad at him. I'm confused I, by all of it. How can you be mad it? at a guy who can do that? Good for him. I'm confused. Really? How it's being pulled off. Oh. I'm confused. That's well, awesome. it, I mean, I say more power to him if he can get it done. Uh, meantime, at 347 this afternoon, we're trying to be very precise with our clock. Craigers, Craig Kilborn, who was in the crowd when the uh, Wolves took care of business against the uh, Los Angeles Clippers of Anaheim, he sent me a photo of uh, he and the broadcast TV broadcast crew right before the game, letting me know he was there. Uh, we haven't checked in. This will be our first Craigers appearance in several months, I think. And so I know he's loving it. Saw a great game, and uh, we'll get his view on uh, the present and future of his favorite basketball team. Maybe a couple Super Bowl thoughts from him and what the Vikings should do with Kirk Cousins because Craigers cares not as much as he does about the Wolves, but he cares about the Purple, doesn't he? He does. Ready to give away some money? Fan of the Big Ten Basketball Tournament. Want to give you a shot to put a grain in your hand? It is our national cash contest, and the keyword for the 3 o'clock hour is money. Go to KFAN.com. On iHeartRadio. The NCHC Frozen Faceoff, bringing the best of college hockey back to the XL Energy Center on March 22nd and 23rd, and you could be there for it. Head over to our contest page. Register for a chance to win a pair of tickets to both days. KFAN.com. Keyword contest. Well, the news is not good out of uh, Kansas City, Missouri. I'm looking at a, a CNN.com story. Upwards of 10 victims injured in a shooting at Union Station at the end of the Chiefs' victory parade, right? The rally, according to Michael Hopkins with the Kansas City Fire Department. Anyone nearby needs to leave the area as quickly and safely as possible to facilitate treatment of the shooting victims. Please avoid the Union State parking garage area to allow first responders through. Three people who were wounded and two who were injured were taken to University Health Truman Medical Center, according to a hospital spokesperson. An estimated one million people were in downtown Kansas City on Wednesday celebrating their team's second Super Bowl title. And the area where the shooting apparently took place was steps away from where the Chiefs held a victory rally for thousands of fans after the parade took place. Um, I, I There may be updated. I, somebody had told me there that there may be uh, fatalities, but we don't know yet. Some outlets are reporting a fatality. Is that correct, Garzi? KCFD, which is what uh, ESPN is going to right now, like the ABC affiliate in Kansas City, might be KMBC as well. They're doing the live shot right now. Ten people shot, three critical, and one dead is what <sighs> the television station is reporting. Players were still on the stage of the victory alley when the shooting took place, mingling with each other after it had ended. While some people had begun filtering out of the area, it was still packed with fans who began to flee in fear after the sound of the shots. Once upon a time, we lamented, historically speaking, um, victory celebrations or um, in-town celebrations the night a team won a title, followed by rioting or following by, followed by stupid behavior 
Um, I, I, I don't remember that we've had a lot of those lately, but we're in new territory. I, I don't remember. Maybe I'm forgetting. I don't remember a lot of occasions where a pep rally or a victory celebration, the parade, uh, is marred. Now, again, the parade had already been done uh, for the you know purposes of accuracy here. But, um, yeah, it's sad. I'll say all the obvious cliched stuff, pathetic, absurd, ridiculous, that you, you can't even celebrate your team's victory without something this heinous taking place. I don't know uh, if we have any details on exactly what took place, whether this was a fight that went bad, and um, guns are everywhere. So, uh, and by the way, that's not an anti-gun rant. It's just factual that... Um, some idiots then decided to participate in uh, in the the gunplay. So I'm sure there'll be more coming on that very story. ABC News reporting one dead. Um, there's a number of different reports out there. None of them good at this point. Which is that fair to say? None of them helpful. Um, championship parades. They write in the CNN story often a time for players to let loose. Yep, and blow off steam as they revel in their victory ahead of the offseason in a virtual news conference on Tuesday. Chiefs head coach Andy Reid told reporters it had been mentioned a couple times to his players not to go overboard with the celebrations. It's great to have fun, but be smart. Um, okay, we got that going uh, from the A section that is um, worthy of uh, note. And where was the other one that I wanted to uh, to get to? And I... It's interesting because different outlets are playing this story differently. Some are screaming the headline. Some are not. I'd be curious to see um, when Kessler joins at 530 what he indeed uh, has on it. Um, but the, the, the apparently, let me back up a little bit on this one to try to get, get it going. This started with um, a statement from House Intelligence uh, Chairman Representative Mike Turner. Um, sent out a statement. Today, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence has made available to all members of Congress information concerning a serious national security threat. I'm requesting that President Biden declassify all information relating to this threat, threat so the Congress, administration, and our allies can openly discuss the actions necessary to respond to this unnamed threat. Then I guess at the White House, um, your guy, uh, the National Security Advisor, was asked about this uh, this very issue, Jake Sullivan, and the the I can't find the, 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 the basically the question is can you put people's minds at ease given that particular statement that was out there from the House Intelligence Committee, and um, Sullivan said. I don't have the exact words in front of me, but basically said, no, I can't. In all good uh, good uh, conscience, I can't totally reassure. So that has started the speculation game on what's the threat, how significant is the threat. And if you go, you don't have to go more than 30 seconds down the X rabbit hole to see that immediately it's be, it's become polarizing and siloed like everything. That, oh, there's no real threat. This is just a way to get, they're trying to get more money for Ukraine. They're trying to get, this is all part of the ploy to to convince, to scare us into giving uh, Congress all the appropriate, and the president, all the appropriations they want. We can't last, like I said, 30 seconds. That, that's what it's broken down into very, very quickly. Um, but what's interesting, like I said, is some outlets are playing it bigger than than others. Um, and there's a million theories that are being thrown out. Was it the Ruskies? Is it Chinese? Is it something in space that we got to worry about here? Is there something else going on? Is there some sort of hypersonic? Is it hypersonic? Is hypersonic pass faster than supersonic? I think it is. I would say yes. If it is, there's some hypersonic mess missile that we, we now know Putin's got at his disposal. So there's, um... There's a lot of stuff rattling around, and and to a, to an extent, it's a fair question to you know how big a deal you make of it because if it's so vague and so general, could you argue that this on any given day 
there are threats that almost rise to this level that we don't hear about that the government is supposed to deal with and they don't make a huge issue of as they attempt to get to the bottom of them, of them so that people don't lose their minds. Because I, they I don't could. Know. A hypersonic weapon, by the way, is defined as between 5 and 25 times the speed of sound or about 1 to 5 miles per second is how fast a hypersonic weapon So that's got to be faster than supersonic, doesn't it? Below In the realm speeds. of sonic, I got to believe hypersonic is above super. I think it is. It's a, because on Wikipedia, it says below such speeds, weapons will be characterized as subsonic or supersonic, while above such speeds, the molecules of the atmosphere disassociate into a plasma. Oh, that's, well, sounds that's, that sounds intense. Yeah. Doesn't it? Yes. Um, so hypersonic is faster than supersonic. So um, then your guy, Mike Johnson... Uh, urges calm after Republicans disclose mysterious national security threat. Um, and then, uh, well, like I said, by the time Kessler joins at 530, there might even be some some developments on this particular case as well, whether there's anything new uh, and what you what exactly you do with it. I guess also it's like, well, if it's if it's this sort of a threat, isn't it going to be pretty hard to declassify everything related to it? I'm all. Uh, I'm all confused by the entire story, so um, we'll see. Um, <laughs> uh, Willow, the uh, Mar Willow, Mark Rosen's cat writes. Uh, Jared Moskowitz, emerging from the SCIF, says it's definitely not about aliens, and it confirms there is no intelligent life in Congress. It's a little frustrating. <laughs> uh, it's too good. Uh, somebody's reminding us that X might not be the place to go for civilized discourse. No. What you'd like to think, though, is that the people who run the country, uh, there was a back and forth the other day between uh, uh, a lefty and a righty. They're both either, I think they're both in Congress. And it got, it got like, it was sixth grade level by the end of it. And that is the time where you want to go. You guys... You guys got to be better than the rest of us, but maybe it's more, it's too much to hope for. You know, it was almost like, nah, 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 that kind of thing back and forth, which I don't think classifies as civilized. Certainly doesn't uh, classify as uh, noble, distinguished debate and discourse right. between two elected, duly elected people that represent us, individuals. Yeah. That is correct. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to break now, get caught up, and then we'll chat with our old buddy, uh, Craig Kilborn, who was at the Wolves Clippers game. I know he's excited about the club. We'll catch up with him on a number of fronts. Don't forget, Kessler will join in studio at 530. If we get more information on uh, Kansas City, we will continue to post on the fan. Uh, musical accompaniment our next guest will order Garzi to produce and I gotta tell you I've told people this for years Craig Kilborn this might be one of the best AM hit driving songs pop songs ever produced this is a big one totally agree oh. I mean I I Hadn't heard it in a while. I also have a 12-inch version of it where it's really the long version, the extended yep. play, where they really go crazy at the beginning with the drums. Mm -hmm. But I told my, I called my friend in New York, my friend Hank, who loves music. He likes Iggy Pop. He likes uh, Jay Ferguson. He likes Thunder Island. He likes all <laughs> yes. these songs. And I said, what do you think of this song? He goes, it's one of my, it's in my top 10. He loves, oh. that song is underrated, Dan. 100%. Uh, I, I, I heard it. You know, I've got, you know, like everybody's got their playlist. I've got like a list now. It's up to like almost 600 songs. And this is absolutely one of them. And it would be high, it'd be high on that list. It's a um, it, underrated is the right term. I don't know that I could name for you or recognize a second sniff in the right. tears song. But one if you do wonder. one this good, this well, yeah. who cares? Benny Mardonis into the night, <laughs> one hit wonder. Yeah, you know that one. I don't even think you could play in in 2024. Isn't that the one that's, that he he was in love with an underage girl? 
she's just 16 oh, years 16. old is the yeah. first that's, line that's and right. i saw i saw somebody cover it and they said she's just 60 years old which <laughs> they just wanted to get to the song and they yes. didn't want to have any controversy yeah, that's one way to do it uh the texts are already pouring in this is from 651 guy he writes, I wasn't lucky enough to be at the Clippers game this week like uh, Kilborn, but I did attend the Hastings-Hudson boys basketball game <laughs> last night. Kilby's squad oh, was edged 83-74, to but I found myself wondering what it would have looked like if we turned the clock back 40-plus years. How would Lord Kilby describe his game and his team? Oh, I've said before, you know, I played a little like Pistol Pete Maravich, a six five, I could shoot and pass. I could I had eyes in the back of my head yeah. like Arvidas and Jason Kidd and Nashi. But uh I, I joked that, you know, the defensive stance hurt my back. <laughs> but uh I was creative and I I remember in uh in fourth grade, I or no fifth grade, I started playing in second grade, but organized ball at Tilden Elementary was in fifth grade and there was a loose ball. In rolling in the corner, I ran it down with the opponent. We were who trying to get it there first, and I grabbed it first, and in one motion went behind my back and started going the other way. Boom! And the, the crowd, Verna Fuller and my mom went, "Ooh!" <laughs> and uh, I was coordinated. I was coordinated. That was the kind of the key. You did know you have? Did you have the the Pete Maravich mop top haircut already by then too? Did you wear your hair long? Yeah, his, you- his hair. I. I have very fine hair. That's why I need hair product. Yes. Pistol had fuller, thicker hair. He did. He did. And I just think he was so cool with the floppy socks. Like, why did he do the socks like that? I thought it was so cool. He'd push them down around his ankles, those thick floppy yes. socks. And uh, But you know what he said, which I loved? He said, when I'm not playing basketball, I'm just waiting to get back on the court, which is my stage. That's it. It's true. Undeniable. I remember talking yeah, to him I had a couple, couple jokes here for you. Uh, before you do jokes. before you do that, let's set the record straight. Six five another six five one guy wants to know this is Northeast guy, what's the name of the song? The name of the song is Driver's Seat. R apostrophe S Seat. Sniff and the Tears. The group. My recollection of the album cover was that it featured a long legged woman in high heels. Uh, on on the cover, am I right, or am I just uh, projecting that that's what I want to think it was? Pretty sure. I don't know. I have. Uh, on, I sent this to Guardsy, and if if this is the album cover, it's a it's a woman in a in a in a car. But I but you might be right. I okay. don't know. Yeah. I could easily look it up. Guardsy can look it up. Do you have? You have. So you have, as always, um, prepared. Do you have your joke writers do the jokes like you used to in the old days when you're on late night TV? Or are these your own jokes? These are. This is just me th- thinking out loud before I come on the air, and right. I make sure I try to remember. You know, sure. I haven't. Yeah, I think you mentioned I hadn't been here in a few months, and I'm I'm here to help. You know, but I'm also realistic. You don't really, you don't really need on the Barrero Show Craig Kilborn when you have Carl Gerbschmidt. You yes. know, some. Sometimes the Barrero show is more of a pro wrestling vibe. Uh, me and Gene be. Okerlund interviewing Mad Dog Vashon. It's not Dick Cavett with Peter O'Toole. Well, that's the beauty of it is the, um, the yin and the yang of it, the contrast of it. Well, there's a different vibe going on there, and I know I'm different. You guys are kind of watching fishing shows on YouTube, and I'm over here watching My Fair Lady on Turner <laughs> Classics. So, anywho. Is that one of the jokes, I by do- the way? Can I do one more? Okay. So as I want to be sure. I, I, I was uncertain whether that was one of the jokes or not. Good to get that clear. <laughs> no, I sometimes get the feeling, and it's okay. It's natural that you and I may be in a different stage. I get the feeling the next time I'm I'm in the Twin Cities, I'll be dining at Mason Margot with Mark Rosen, and you'll be having lunch at White Castle with Blair Walsh. So <laughs> it's it's part of the process of life, you know? Yeah, it's okay, I think. I don't think that... Um, <laughs> I, by the way, I thought you were a huge White Castle guy back in the day. Or I is, was is it when beneath, I was in eighth grade. It's beneath in you eighth now. Grade. Beneath you now. Yeah. 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 Well, I, you're not going to win any friends. If I mean, we do have some blue collar, you know, I, uh, I love listeners. It. We're, we're not just beautiful people listeners. So you're, are you worried about alienating the blue collar types? I'm just uh, struggling a little bit with the wild this year. We got to keep Ooh. working on our, yeah. you know, but um, very pleased with the Timberwolves and I, 
I do have three beautiful points I want to run by you when you want to start talking Wolves. Well, let's remind folks you were at the uh, Wolves-Clippers game uh, before they just knocked off Portland last night. I saw a tremendous performance by the Wolves in which they, they, they dominated the second half of the ball game against a team that was as hot as anybody. The Clippers had won 27 of their previous 33 at home. They were becoming the fashionable pick to win the Western Conference. They still might be the fashionable pick to win. So you're there. Um, I'm assuming not in the blue-collar seats. And um, you must have enjoyed the hell out of it because that was a, um, a nice little performance by your favorite club. Yeah, I, w- I went into the game thinking we were going to play well, kind of. I went into the same way thinking we were going to play well at OKC when we won there without Mike Conley, stunningly. And uh, and I watched the game, and we were kind of up, you know, six and eight most of the way. And then we had a bad ending to the first quarter and then an awful ending to the second quarter where Kawhi got thunder dunks and the crowd went crazy. And it was, you know, thank God it was in the second quarter, not the fourth quarter. Because yeah. momentum, you know, one of the things in that Chicago game was Kobe White got red hot and was shooting from way out. And uh, old Mo, I mean, Mr. Momentum, you, you know, it's hard to overcome that. But um, I was I was surprised uh, that we won so easily at uh, the Clips. Our defense is is amazing sometimes. Rudy is, I mean, underrated. He changes the everything. But it is a it is a team it is a team effort because we have different guys, a lot of different guys that can guard people. So um, I wanted to tell you three points and tell me what you think about our. These are the I can unlock one key to maybe helping us be a better team. All right, give us, give us one, and then we'll probably okay. get a break because we got to stay on some ske- uh, get, uh, stay on okay. schedule. That's very important. Yeah, give us give us your first of three Timberwolves observations from the uh, occasionally agile, uh, <laughs> occasionally funny mind of. <laughs> so, <laughs> does that mean the jokes were just so so? That's yeah, okay. Yeah. They were fine. They were okay. I thought okay, I okay. thought you could have done better, but that's okay. okay. That's just me. Um. So. The uh, the turnovers are the big problem, and are you familiar with the term? Because I haven't, heard, I don't hear people talk use this term anymore. Floor game. He has a nice floor game. Do you remember that term? I or, do absolutely. Or yes, remember floor well. game. Smart passing, yes. right decisions, no mm-hmm. turnovers. A good feel for the game. Mm-hmm. And and I think we have one starter with a good floor game, and that's Mike Conley. Correct. And then maybe three bench guys. Uh, Jordan McLaughlin has one, but he's not going to necessarily play a lot now. Uh, Slow Mo has a good floor game, and Monte Morris, I know, has a good floor game. I can already tell, and I've read about him and yep. the non the non turnovers. So guys like Jaden and Nas, they don't pass particularly well. No, and 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 then um, the problem is your two best players, in my opinion, have to improve their floor game, and that's Ant yep. and Cat. Especially Ant, because he handles the ball more than Cat. Now, Ant is an unbelievable player. It's a little stunning what he can do sometimes offensively. We're blessed to have Anthony Edwards. And I don't want to put more pressure on him, but he has to learn how to handle these double teams, and he has to make smart decisions and a better feel for the game. And he's not fundamentally sound necessarily. Uh, But he's learning the game, and he's adapting well. But you've got to improve your floor game. Yep. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, in the playoffs, it's going to it's gonna come back to bite you. Uh, let's do this. Let's pause. I'll react to what you had to say there because there's a couple of uh, important points to make on it. You've got a couple other ones to get to. I still have a, a couple more questions about how you handled yourself at the Clippers game uh, when you watched the Wolves there just a couple of nights ago. And um, maybe we'll include some fascinating texts that have come in. Craig Kilborn with us. Kessler will join... In studio after he brings the uh, sack of uh, 